Line to line's a braidable coating on the volute of a turbo or a centrifugal supercharger. Does it work? Well, we have data like nobody else does. Come on, let's take a deep dive. Having an electrically driven turbocharger, supercharger, whatever you want to call it, gives us an opportunity to get some unique data that nobody else can get. And in this case, we can get real numbers on if coating a volute actually is worth power. Let's just dive right in. So the most obvious place to start is looking at the dynographs. Let's start with that. So this is our dynograph comparison of the line to line coded volute. Now, as I mentioned in the other video, which if you're here, you've probably seen it. If you haven't, I'll put a link in the corner up above, but the weather was a lot worse, not just a little worse, but a lot worse. So peak horsepower numbers are down. And in fact, you'll notice they're significantly down in case you haven't seen that video. It's a difference of like 40 horsepower naturally aspirated. However, we almost completely eliminated that gap with no other changes other than the line to line coated volute. And of course there's a torque converter change in there, but that really shouldn't make much of a difference because of the gear ratio thing that I also explained in that video. But let's take a look at the change in horsepower because that's what dynos are good for is comparing differences. So here we had a max power of 512 horsepower. That's with turning on the electric turbo and doing like literally nothing else. We just turned, flipped the switch and, and matted the gas coming off of a 344.67 naturally aspirated best. So that gives us a difference of 167.33 horsepower. It's 167 horsepower from less than seven PSI of boost. And that doesn't suck. But how does that compare with the last time we were on the dyno? So let's pull up those graphs. So our best naturally aspirated pull last time was 385.59 horsepower. You can see the power peak is different. The shape of the curve is different. Again, you know, that has to do with not so much the converter, but I think a lot of that has to do with weather. I'm sure the converter played a role, but when you have such vastly different days, which I'm not going to reiterate here because this video is going to get super long if I do, we're interested in the change in horsepower. So again, if we look at the optimized but fair comparison, which was our second to last pull, not our last pull, but our second to last pull, where we maxed out at 524 horsepower, as you can see right here. Now, if you're a frequent flyer on my channel, you'll quickly identify that this is not the 532 horsepower pull. And there's a reason for that. In these videos, I do show you a lot of my cards, but remember, I'm a racer. I'm not gonna show you all of my cards. I did a few tricks on that last pull to pick up a few numbers. Now I can off the top of my head think of three things I could have done to pick up another 20 clicks, but you know, that really wouldn't be terribly fair, but there was just a few things I couldn't resist doing, but I'm gonna keep those close to my chest. So let's get back to the graph. So here we are again, let's zoom into the numbers. And what we're interested in is the Delta. And again, we had 167.33 horsepower that we picked up this time around with very little difference other than the coded volute. And of course, once again, the converter, because I know somebody's going to say it in the comments, but please go back and watch the other video where I spent like four minutes explaining that whole mess. 167.33 horsepower. And this one had a difference of 138.41. That gives us a difference of 29 horsepower. The coded volute still made almost 30 horsepower more. I could just hear some people typing away in the comments right now about the converter, but I, I, I just can't resist. I got to jump in on this real quick. Let's go back to the dynograph here real quick and take a look at the gear ratios. So as the converter slip or convert or do whatever magic juju that converters do do, if you look at doo-doo, if you look at this, you'll see our gear ratios are very comparable. Not a whole lot of difference here. You know, under boost, we were at 49.19 versus 49.24, and then naturally aspirated, we're at just over 46 and just under 46. I mean, that's pretty darn close. So the converter is not playing a huge role here. Weather is converter is not. So now the next logical thing that I know anybody would think is like, well, wait a second. Turbos make fake atmosphere. Well, yeah, they do, but this this isn't your normal turbo. This, this is electrically driven. We have a fixed amount of drive. So let's take a look at the ESC data log next. 
The MGM ESC saves everything as a CSV, a comma-separated variable data log, and a spreadsheet is actually kind of the quickest, fastest way to look at it. Basically, you know, I'm not going to zoom into any parts of this thing or anything, but really what you want to look at is, let's look at it in various points in time. So you'll notice it goes to 100% input request. That's throttle. I have a different control box this time if we look at the old one you'll see that it takes a bit to ramp up, but it made no difference in the spool up time at all, which is why I was like, let's just go for the easier, more reliable thing, because we did have those computer issues at the track where it kind of crapped out. Well, it left a lot harder because the glove box door opened up and everything flew out, but uh, it, it laid over, oh, I don't know, not too far into the run, like it, like it just lost everything, everything. And I think that has to do with the massive electromagnetic interference that this thing generates when it runs and a microcontroller and that this kind of EMI, well, it's not exactly a healthy mix in close proximity. So I went simpler this time and redid the controller. In fact, I shot a whole video on this thing, but I never cut it, never uploaded it because I'm not sure this is gonna be the final iteration. And eventually we're gonna to have to be able to put in some steps. So to make it, at least somewhat variable in terms of application, but right now we're drag racing, so that's all that really counts. Let's just start with the first column because that's easiest. Look at our input voltage. So we're at 61.893, 61.771, 61.544. So basically just shy of 62. And look where we were last time, 61.771, 61.649, 61.492, basically exactly the same. And so then let's take a look at how long it took to spool up. So if we go down and find our max speed, which is going to be right off the hit, it took us about 1.9 or 2 seconds. At 1.9 seconds here, we're at 32,220 RPM. And at 2 seconds, we're at the same RPM. In fact, that is the peak RPM that we saw this time. Last time, we were at 31,770 RPM at 1.9 seconds. But then at 2 seconds in, we were just shy of 32,000 RPM. In fact, 20 RPM shy of 32,000 RPM. So you will notice as you look down this, this whole row here, if we scroll down, you'll see, you know, I mean, the pull is not that long. A dyno pull only takes like five or six seconds, depending on how much power you're making. But, you know, we stayed above 31,000 RPM pretty much the whole time, and we didn't quite make 32,000 RPM. And this time, we did break 32,000 RPM, but just barely, but it's the same thing. It dropped down. It didn't drop down quite so far as it did, but it's not a huge difference. It's a few hundred RPM. And, you know, honestly, what I really attribute that to is the difference in air density. The air is less dense. It takes less power to spin the impeller. And so you're going to get a little bit more RPM, right? It's just that simple. So the line to line coding does not make anything work significantly harder. Uh, it doesn't really change the speed of the turbo at a given, or electric supercharger, at a given power input anyway. But let's, let's just take a look. Let's look at the power, shall we? <laughs> this is the part that makes me laugh. I said I wasn't going to zoom into this, and I probably am not going to when I go to edit this thing. But, I mean, look, come on. We hit a peak of 38.5 kilowatts. If I turn everything on at my house all at once, it's not going to draw this much power. This is nuts. But, hey, it's a good nuts, right? But generally, we're averaging around 36 kilowatts, I would say, is a fair number, looking down this, this line here. And if we compare that to last time... Yeah, we didn't hit a crazy peak. We hit just shy of 36 kilowatts. And it seems like our average would be more like 35 kilowatts. In fact, let's just pick a time. Let's say, you know, what was it doing at four seconds in? So last time at four seconds in down here, if I go across, hopefully I get this right, it's 35,350 watts. And four seconds in this time was 35,600 watts. So, you know, about a kilowatt difference, which when you're talking about this kind of power level, ain't that much different. But why is there any difference? You know, our current draw was, was higher too, but not, again, not gargantuanly so, but it was a bit higher. If we look at the current input, this is the old dyno pole. You're talking about a peak of what, 676 amps, basically? Do I, I see 678, I don't see any 700s. 
But I mean, we're talking about some serious power here, people. This this is no joke. Six hundred and seventy nine. Uh, 685, we did see 685 here, and this was the time before, and if we go to this time, we saw a peak of, we did see 725 briefly, uh, but most of it's in the 680 range, I would say. There's a 699, 697, 671, 668... Yeah, you know, it's kind of, oh, it hit up to 700 here. We can make a reasonably educated guess as to why the motor revolutions are higher. It's simply because the air was less dense. But why is the current higher? I mean, it's not like hugely higher. The, the power is the, you know, it's current times voltage, and that really tells you what we're dealing with. And it's about, I would say, on average, just looking, just eyeballing this, is about maybe a kilowatt difference. But why is there a kilowatt difference? Well, that you can also answer by looking at the ESC logs. So if we look at the controller temperature, it's just this simple. This is where the difference is. Yeah, there's going to be some losses at running a little bit higher. I mentioned the weather was a lot worse here. We we're 34 degrees Celsius, and we wind up at about 40 degrees Celsius throughout the pole. Last time, we started exactly 10 degrees Celsius cooler. Now, I know that in and of itself doesn't make any power, but the ESC is right over the batteries. And, you know, one trait of lithium batteries is they make more power when they're warm. And that's what we're seeing here. But that is not a 30 horsepower difference. And I can prove that to you by looking at the actual data logs from the Megasquirt. So let's take a look at those. So this is the first data log. This is the naturally aspirated data log from the Megasquirt. And you can tell that, you know, I mean, it's, it's basically what you would expect. A white line is RPM. You know, green line is throttle position. It just goes up and stays there. Red line is is manifold air pressure here. And yellow line in this top graph is AFR. And in the bottom graph, the red line is duty cycle. The white line is spark advance. And the green line is manifold air temperature. So our manifold air temperature, if we look down here on the averages, it was pretty warm, you know, it was 117.9 degrees to start and hit a high of 127 degrees. And if we want to compare that to the manifold air temperature from last time. So last time we were quite a bit cooler. We were at a low of 90 and a high of 98. I mean, that's, that is actually quite the huge difference between 117.9 and 127. So that is what I'm talking about in terms of the air density. You can clearly see it here, and you can see it in the duty cycle differences. I already compared this in the other video. Uh, the spark advance, that didn't really get very affected. We did actually hit a peak of 30 degrees this time, and last time we hit a peak of... Well, 30 degrees, 24 to 30 degrees on this one. And this time it was 24 to 30 degrees. So that was exactly the same. So spark advance had no effect on this. Air quality was worse. So everything tells you that this should be less power or less gain in power. But yet it was more of a gain in power. In fact, let's take a look. So here is our boosted pole with the coated volute. And here you can clearly see, well, the boost does what the boost does. You know, the electric turbo ramps up and then it starts to drop off as RPM rises. It doesn't drop off a whole lot. You know, we're not talking, we're, we're not talking about like three PSI or anything. It's like a pound or two. In fact, uh, you know, I don't want to lose my averages yet. Otherwise I'd, I'd poke around on there, but where this line is right now, it's at six and a half pounds and it has a peak of 6.8 pounds so this is three tenths of a pound from here to here so this may be another what pound or so of boost but let's take a look at the averages so the averages down here this is what's really interesting to me so our spark advance is starting to get affected by the manifold air temperature because it did get that hot uh, it hit a peak of 156 degrees and right now i have the efi set to start pulling timing at 140 degrees. So if we take a look at the mat curve, which is the green line down here, you can see it does start to rise like considerably. So we went from 128 to 156, giving us a delta of 27.3 degrees and an average of 140 degrees. And if we compare that with last time, look at the difference. We got a bigger delta, which is interesting, but that could just be because the air is colder to start with, and it's a lot colder to start with, but we never hit the point where we are actually pulling timing. It never hit 140 degrees. The curve is very similar. The boost is very similar. 
the boost is actually only about a tenth of a pound difference. But again, we basically have an almost fixed impeller speed. The boost is effectively the same. You know, at this point, it's also 6.5 PSI, just like it was in the other pole, where it was also 6.5 PSI at that point. So, I mean, these are really freaking identical. AFR is 11.5 here, and here it's 11.8. It's actually a little bit leaner, so this should make a little bit more power, yet it gained less power. So this is all pretty definitive and very interesting data to me. And if it's interesting data to you, please go ahead and click the subscribe button because this really is the only channel where you're gonna get this kind of data. I mean, nobody else can even do this kind of testing because nobody else has something like this to test with. So please subscribe, make the algorithm happy because you know we do finally move down to Texas and we finish... Uh... <laughs> with the lovely contractor issues that I'm having. I don't want to talk about it. Oh wait, I set something up. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> I ordered a stream deck to make these videos easier to make and it's all like pre-programmed with stuff now. So all I have to do is hit buttons. It's kind of like being at work for me. So looking at all this data, like the only conclusion that one can reasonably make is that the volute coating does not make the turbo or supercharger work harder, but it makes it more efficient. It doesn't even make more boost necessarily. It's just more efficient boost. So think about what I just said. It doesn't really increase the boost level, although it might a little bit because again, the air density was very different. But at effectively the exact same boost pressure, you're gaining almost 30 horsepower at the wheels. Think about that. Think about the advantages of that. You know, of course, everybody wants to make more boost and everybody's like, oh, I need something to make 8,000 PSI of boost. Well, yeah, that's great if you make like one horsepower. Um, but, you know, if you're making a good amount of power, you don't need that much boost. But the more boost you add, the smaller your tuning window effectively becomes. You know, the, the hotter your intake temperatures. Everything gets less efficient with more boost pressure. So you want to make as much power as you can with as low of a boost level as you can. And that's what the line-to-line -line coding actually does. And I'm sure this is gonna make the guys at line-to-line -line extremely happy. Uh, very rarely do the stars align on a product that has you know, basically heretofore been untested with this kind of testing methodology. And you know, it works, it really works. I'm gonna put a link to their website in the description below because I mean, for what you're paying, it, it's, it, it, freaking works <laughs> when i was younger there was this uh speed shopper in town called rockville speed and custom and there was a guy there uh we used to call him jesus speed and jesus speed was a bit of a burnout and uh you know i i didn't know much back then i was i think in my teens still when he was around uh and uh you know i would ask him like is this is this gonna make my car faster and like like i said he was he was a little bit fried and he'd say yeah it'll go fast but thanks so much for watching. Again, don't forget to subscribe and click the like button and all that happy stuff so we can continue to build this channel because there are very big plans, as you know. And the next video is going to be a deep dive into the meth injection. And boy, howdy, do we sure know that that worked. So I'll catch you all in the next one.